Hi there, A-Pushers. This is Mr. Vieira and Mr. Eskridge. And we are going to take you guys through Chapter 1, The New World. Um, this is part of your summer assignment. And just a quick reminder before we get started and before we get into the content, the reading quiz for Chapter 1 is on your first day of school. And you are allowed, of course, to use your reading notes on um, that test on that first day. So we're going to go ahead and get into it, beginning with the peopling of America. So before Christopher Columbus, any European sets foot on the continent of North America, Central America, South America, there's obviously human beings there. Now, um, most historians agree that people crossed from Asia into North America using the Bering Strait. Now, this is possible because... Uh, during the Ice Age, there was far less seawater, and so there was a land bridge which allowed people to traverse the Bering Strait and enter North America. Now, through thousands of years, these people spread through North America into Central America and then, of course, into South America. And it wasn't just one homogenous group like um, Disney makes it out to be. Uh, people that settled in the Americas developed distinct languages, there were social structures, there were powerful tribes, there were uh, less powerful tribes, and uh, they developed culture and societies of their own um, that we're going to get into here shortly. I think one of the ways that we can see um, this very like diverse culture um, that existed and peoples um, prior to European contact is through those 2,000 um, various languages um, that were spoken amongst the um, Native American people. And here's just a, a quick um, map of what the, the Bering Strait um, land bridge would have looked like um, during the Ice Age on the left, and then um, once the ice melted and the sea um, covered the bridge. Okay, so um, on the eve of European um, contact or conquest, um, as we mentioned earlier, the Native American people had these very diverse um, political, economic, and social systems. Um, that Europeans, once they, they landed, um, although they saw them as being um, inferior to European political, economic, and cultural um, practices, um, they were, in fact, really diverse um, and very developed um, on their own. And so we really see the, the development, the domestication of corn or maize um, around 5000 BC um, in Mexico, um, starting in central Mexico around where Mexico City is today. Um, and then we see the, the spread of corn um, northward and southward um, throughout the Americas. And what corn allowed people to do is to um, become more settled um, in their, um, their villages and allow them to, um, you know, kind of um, domesticate themselves um, more. Um, and so we see um, nomadic people settling down um, and starting, when people settle down, then they start to develop um, deeper and richer political, um, economic, and um, social connections with one another. Um, there's a number of um, powerful tribes or kind of powerful regions throughout um, North America, um, particularly in what will become the United States, um, that historians look to um, as kind of um, examples um, that they differ based on region. So in um, the Southwest, we have the Pueblo people um, in the Rio Grande River that are developing um, their own culture, their own political um, economic systems. Up in the Northeast, um, we have the Iroquois, um, who again are more developed. Um, settled, and that's really where, um, at least, um, the English are going to come in contact with first. Um, and then down in the Mississippi River Valley, we have the Cahokia, um, which is a good example of um, kind of the diversity um, of and the, the structure of the Native American peoples um, in these dense populations. Okay, so here, a lot of what you're going to experience in AP U.S. history, and one of the things that myself and Mr. Eskridge will both preach is using specific examples when you're writing, uh, in conversation, and discussions that we have in class. And so throughout these lectures that we give, we're going to show you guys the way in which we use specific historical examples. So uh, we mentioned the Cahokia uh, tribe of the Mississippi River Valley, and this is an artist rendering of what that settlement looked like. And as you can see, when the Europeans land in the New World, civilization was present here. Uh, obviously, there's more famous cases of the Aztecs and Incas, but in the modern-day United States, 
uh, there's cases of these massive, powerful um, tribes that had a social structure, uh, government systems of their own, and the Cahokia are a good example of that. Um, it, they were tens of thousands of people living in this city um, when Columbus sets foot in the New World in the 1490s. Um, and here is just uh, another example um, of those those diverse and really um, established um, populations. Um, so here in the south, the southwest, we have the Pueblo, the, the cliff dwellings, these highly defensible um, structures and communities that were um, literally carved into um, the, the faces of these rocks. Um, so yeah, just shows the diversity. Okay, so let's talk a little bit deeper about the people themselves, their lifestyle, their their day to day, day in, day out, what we what we saw in the Americas on the eve of conquest. So uh, one of the things that was common throughout the southeast United States was an agricultural practice known as three sister farming. Now, three sister farming uh, involved planting corn, bean and squash together. Um, and, and this would lead to the Native American tribes in the southeast and on the east coast of what is the modern day United States having high caloric intake. Now, when we, in chapter two, we'll talk about Jamestown and we'll talk about some other English settlements. But one of the, one of the realities is that the tribes that the English um, settled in when colonization began were much taller than them, healthier than them, had longer life expectancy than their English counterparts. And a lot of that is due to the diet. Um, the diet of tribes such as the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, uh, the Powhatan Nation, which we'll talk about in chapter two. Um, these were healthy people who used the land um, and had a unique uh, concept of land ownership that Mr. Eskridge will discuss. Um, okay. so. Um we're going to be doing a lot um, of a push of really comparing and contrasting um, different communities. And at the beginning of the course, we're looking at um, you know what is European, what do the Europeans bring to the table, um, and then what do the Native Americans bring, and later we'll introduce what do Africans um, bring to what will become this kind of mosaic of um, what will become the United States. And so one of the first things that we need to talk about is land ownership. Um, and just kind of the difference in concept of land ownership between Europeans um, and people in the Americas. So in the European concept, um, land was more privately owned. Um, and we'll see this much later when we see, um, if you remember from old history, the enclosure movement um, and kind of that shift towards um, industrialization, um, which we're starting to see the seeds of um, during this time. Um, so in again, in Europe, um, land was more privately owned and therefore, um, you know, if, if Mr. Vieira owned some land, um, I did not necessarily have the right to go on his land and do whatever I wanted there. Um, and so that's very much how the Europeans saw um, land use, as it was, you know, held within um, an individual or a family. Um, and therefore, outsiders could not come and interact with that land without, you know, maybe having to, to fight for it or pay for it or in some, in like that in some ways. Um, whereas in the United States, or what would become the U.S. Um, in North America, we have um, kind of different ideas of land ownership, where land was more communal, um, and land existed for the benefit of the people. Um, and we're going to see this play out in numerous different ways um, later. But um, so when Europeans come, they lay stake, um, you know, they claim this land in the name of England, this land in the name of Spain, and in the name of Portugal. Um, and for Native Americans, they don't understand that concept because land is not held that way. So they're really baffled by how, how can these people come and say that this is their, their territory? How can they claim ownership over this? Um, and so we're going to see, um, you know, conflict over that, um, those different things. So moving on. Um, so this is, we just put this here as an example for you guys to see the three sister farming method, what it actually looks like. So you can see the diagram on the left hand side. And then um, just your regular stock photo that we pulled from the internet of what three sister farming looks like. So the corn, the beans, and the squash uh, all planted together, maximizing the use uh, of the land. Okay, so another thing that we're going to um, really hit on and hammer on um, throughout this course is 
when we look at immigration, when all right, uh, sorry, we got cut off there. All right, so um, as we've talked about, um, we're going to be talking a lot about um, immigration um, with an I, which is moving between countries, and we'll also talk about immigration with an E, which is moving within a country, and we'll also talk about migration, um, which is kind of just more general um, moving around. Um, and so when we talk about immigration, immigration, and migration, the things that we always are emphasizing is that there's always push and pull factors involved. So um, literally, probably never does someone just wake up one morning and is like, I'm going to move to you know, a different country. I'm going to get on a ship and sail across the ocean. Um, there's something that's always like driving um, and motivating a person or people to, to get up and to move. Um, and so when we look at um, what pushes European, what push factors are involved um, in Europe that push them, um, to expand beyond um, their their countries, um, their nation states, um, beyond um, you know, into the oceans, um, onto other continents. And so um, there's many factors going on. Um, and historians kind of identify um, three big factors that um, that played a role in pushing Europeans um, out of um, the European continent. Um, the first one is a desire to capitalize on Asian products. So um, between the 1300s and 1400s, 1500s, we have a lot of um, Asian products that are coming to European markets. We've had the Silk Road for a long time, um, moving these um, spices, um, silks, other things from Asia, from Asian markets um, to European um, markets. And a lot of European foods were really bland. Um, a lot of spices that we take for, for granted now come from um, parts of Asia. and so. Um, and a lot of other kind of precious products that Europeans wanted to get control of. And so what we really, the Europeans that we see pushing um, out first are the, the Spanish, Spanish and the Portuguese. And um, the Spanish and the Portuguese, what they're really trying to do is to cut out the middleman, um, which was a lot of your um, Italian merchants that are in the Mediterranean Sea that are um, starting to, you know, um, charge um, the Spanish, charge um, the Portuguese charge other Europeans um, taxes and they're starting to you know, charge more for these products. And so they want easier access to these markets. Um, so Portugal is kind of the first um, European country that pushes out and they're looking for a more direct route to these Asian products um, in order to take advantage of that. So um, that's kind of the first one um, having to do with economic aspects. The second push factor kind of deals on what, with what Mr. Eskridge was just talking about and that's competition. Um, in Europe, you had seen the rise and kind of the consolidation of uh, different areas of the continent to these powerful nation states that were run by a powerful monarch. For example, you had Spain, you had England, you had France, and these new nation states are competing with one another for resources, for power. And one of the ways in which these countries now, or kingdoms, uh, saw an opportunity to get a leg up or have an advantage on their European counterpart was by having access to resources. And so you were going to see uh, in the 15th century, 16th century, these, these, this new rivalry kind of start between the Portuguese, Spanish, English, and the French uh, for access to resources that can bring wealth to um, their empire. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, uh, the Portuguese um, and the Spanish and later the English um, and also the Dutch are going to be these first countries and the French as well are going to be the first European countries that really kind of launch out um, from, the, from their land um, into the ocean in order to find um, these, these new markets or these new trade routes. And that was really aided by the, the development of these new maritime technologies. Um, so we have developments in shipbuilding. We have ships that are being built bigger, um, stronger. Um, they can withstand, um, you know, what it's like to travel on the sea um, with bigger waves, um, more um, kind of temperamental conditions. And we also have um, developments in navigation um, tools. So um, Europeans and sailors were able to better place themselves um, in the world um, geographically. So they were able to, you know, start. Um, developing more maps, we see the cartography or map making just really explode and we start to see these um, what look like really basic maps to us now um, were really highly developed um, at that time. So that kind of allowed people to have more confidence as they set out um, to explore new regions.
Okay, so again, just to kind of review that previous slide, the, these powerful nation states competing with one another with a desire to find access to uh, resources that they cannot get on the continent of Europe. And here you have a map of Europe on the eve of Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. Now, of course, famously in 1492, Christopher Columbus quote unquote discovers the New World. I don't know if you can actually discover something that has people living on it. It's like somebody from Hanford saying, look at this new land of Isaiah that I found. But he discovers a new world for Europeans, by and large. So uh, far more important than Christopher Columbus, the person, is the system that his discovery sets up uh, in terms of global trade. So when Christopher Columbus lands in the new world, that sets in motion um, what we call the Columbian Exchange. Now, the Columbian Exchange was a system of trading routes and the movement of resources, living things, human beings that impacts four continents. And we have those listed here. You can see the reasons for or, or the different ways that the continents were impacted. You start off with Europe. Now, Europe is going to provide the markets and the capital, and they are going to be the colonizers. The Europeans are the continent that is going to spread their influence throughout the world, um, conquering, subduing people in two other or three other continents. You have the New World. The New World, of course, includes North America and South America, and that's in the Columbian Exchange system. That is where the natural resources come in. Gold, silver, um, plants, animals, resources that the Europeans could not get on their continent, they are going to pull and extract from the New World. And then, of course, uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, Africa will provide resources to Europe, but it will also provide the labor that makes this system run. And that, of course, is in the form of slave labor, which was not new to, which wasn't invented with the Columbian Exchange, but it will really be systematically um, put in place as a result of European colonization of uh, North and South America. All right, um, so just kind of, kind of touch briefly um, a little bit. Again, we're trying to establish that um, when Europeans arrived in um, North America, in the New World, and they did not find peoples that were you know, backwards, that were undeveloped, um, uncivilized, um, but that they found um, peoples that had these really highly developed societies. Um, and so one of the things that we can think of is, you know, how were Europeans able to um, relatively quickly subdue um, and establish control over um, these other populations? And um, so we have this idea of guns, germs, and steel. Um, and so think of this as kind of like a suitcase, um, suitcases that Europeans are carrying with them. Um, on their ships, um, on their horses, as they're going out and making contact with all these new people, um, be it in the New World, North America, Central America, South America, um, on the continent of Africa, um, to a certain extent, um, and then even in Asia as well. So if we think of guns, we're thinking of superior um, weapon technology. Um, Europeans had um, adopted, had um, pretty much stolen from Asia, um, from China, the use of gunpowder. Um, and so Europeans have um, guns and you know it's you never you don't you know take a knife to a gunfight kind of thing um, because guns are superior they can um, you know subdue someone a lot quicker and um, then we have germs and that's really an important thing of the Columbian Exchange um, is the fact that Europeans brought these microbes they brought diseases with them um, that they did not really know that they had with them um, that turned out to be extremely powerful um, weapons and useful um, in subduing these um, other peoples. And Europeans have developed these from their domestication um, of other animals like cows, pigs, um, sheep, other goats, other things like that. And so they had developed these close relationships with them, um, lived near them. And so um, they became immune to a lot of these diseases that the animals carried. Um, and people in the New World um, did not have um, any real large draft animals or domesticated animals. Um, so they did not have um, immunities to those diseases. And then steel. So this kind of just goes to superior technology um, that the um, native peoples of America just didn't have. And therefore, um, Europeans were able to use that in order to subdue those people. Okay, and then this is an image that you will see again, and you'll probably see uh, for the rest of the school year, really. And it's the Columbian Exchange kind of graphically represented. Um, and you can see the movement of 
people, the movement of resources, crops. Okay, so again, um, this just represents the movement of the living things in the Columbian Exchange, the most important of which uh, in terms of uh, the next 100 years of colonization is probably going to be disease, as Mr. Eskridge said. Um, so. All right. Um, so Spain is really the, um, the first European country to make contact. Um, as Mr. Vieira talked about, um, Columbus um, sets sail. He convinces um, the Spanish queen and king to fund his expedition. Um, so he's sailing under the Spanish flag, um, even though he's Italian. Um, and so we have um, Spain make contact. Um, they, Christopher Columbus first lands um, in the Caribbean um, on what will become um, the island that is half of it is Haiti, half of it is the Dominican Republic. Um, and then from there, he's going to um, quote unquote discover um, the other um, islands in the Caribbean um, and before um, the Spanish finally get to um, mainland North America um, in um, like the Yucatan Peninsula um, um, in Mexico. Okay, so um, what Spain really develops after they um, are able to conquer the Aztecs and other um, developed peoples within um, Central America and uh, Mexico is that Spain is going to look at, you know, how do we how do we control this region now? And so what Spain establishes first is known as the Encomienda system. I mean, the Encomienda system has shown up uh, multiple times on previous English exams, um, you know, comparing and contrasting Spanish colonization with English um, or with others. So it's important that we know and understand the Encomienda system. Um, and basically, under the Encomienda system, the Spanish crown would give a plot of land, um, whatever the size of that would be, um, to um, a, a Spaniard, um, to someone that would petition the king, you know, I want control over this, this region in the New World. Um, and that Spaniard, that per individual, was given not just control of the land, but also the Indians that live on the land, um, with the promise that that Spaniard would um, convert the Indians, the natives, to Christianity, um, therefore, um, you know, bringing those cultural um, practices um, of Spain to the New World. Um, and basically, the Encomienda system is just um, slavery. Um, and so um, the Spanish kind of use this idea of, um, you know, this guise of Christianity, yet really, um, when we look at it, what it really is, is um, using Indian labor to fuel um, the Spanish economy um, in growing sugar um, for European markets. All right, so here is a map of the Americas, kind of the, the different um, parts of the two continents that the various European powers had colonized or were responsible for colonizing. Um, you can see just by looking at the map, uh, the possibility of potential conflict, especially in modern day Canada, modern day the United States with French and English colonization. So stay tuned for that. Wrapping up chapter one, uh, we'll discuss Spanish contact with the Americas. So as Mr. Eskridge said uh, just now, the encomienda system was set up and was a systematic way for the Spanish to have a labor source and then um, to kind of set in motion their plan to conquer the New World. Now, the Spanish conquest sets up these specific trends with relation to the Americas. The first one is resource extraction. Um, the Spanish land that they conquered, when they set up their colonies, they struck gold quite literally. Um, the Spanish conquered parts of the New World that were rich in mineral wealth. Um, for example, silver and gold with the Aztec and the Inca empires. And so um, they will uh, kind of set the precedent that in the New World, it's, it's a land that's rich in gold, which obviously was true for the Spanish, but as we'll see with chapter two and chapter three, English colonization um, in the New World is going to take on a totally different, um, totally different kind of reality when they start to establish colonies on the east coast of uh, North America. Um, so yeah, so as Mr. Baird alluded to, um, in um, North, other parts of North America, um, the English will find um, that agriculture is really what the, they're going to start making their money off of. So we'll see tobacco, um, we'll see um, other products like indigo, rice, 
um, and then we'll see fishing, we'll see um, extracting um, trees in the form of one lumber to build ships and other things like that. Um, and another trend that it sets up um, and that we'll continue to see um, is the enslaving of local populations. So we kind of mentioned that already with the Encomienda system. Um, we're going to see that um, trend continue later on with the English. Um, prior to the use of African um, forced slavery, um, we have um, Europeans using, utilizing the local populations, um, forcing them into to work the land, um, to um, again extract the land of those minerals of those agricultural products. And oftentimes, those um, native peoples were enslaved and worked until um, they died of disease or they died from over, um, you know, just working too hard. Um, and then lastly, the last trend that's set in motion, uh, as we previously discussed, cultural conversion. Um, part of Spanish colonization, and this is going to be a theme throughout most of European colonization, uh, was this concept of saving souls, that the Spanish came to the New World, and Christopher Columbus especially, came with this idea that they were going to uh, find land in the name of the crown, but then also they were going to save souls uh, in the name of the church. And so what you saw, which was commonplace throughout the New World, especially in Central America, was this forced conversion of religious beliefs onto local populations. And often this was done brutally through forms of torture uh, and murder to set examples for those individuals that were um, likely to resist this conversion. Um, so I think that that pretty much covers everything for chapter one, The New World. Remember, uh, obviously this is the summertime and both myself and Mr. Eskridge uh, are probably hard at work doing nothing, but we are uh, excited to begin the new year off with you guys. And one last reminder, you are responsible for reading chapter one on American Yop. I hope that you will find it entertaining. Uh, we do, but we're nerds. And uh, we will have that reading quiz on the first day of school. So have a great summer.